Well, any ideas what might happen now? That the uh, alpha carbon would actually attack uh, the carbonyl carbon that's on the same chain. That's right. Good, that's right. It's theoretically possible that it could attack a carbonyl and another molecule, but it's usually, uh, it's going to be, it's, it's probably going to run into the, this carbonyl faster. Intramolecular reactions can be faster than intramolecular. So that's a good insight. So let's see if we can draw the mechanism for that step. It seems like it, it, it uh, would be uh, well, I'm just gonna, um, now one thing that might be messing you up is you drove this arrow for the alpha carbon attacking the number two, mm -hmm. but I think you left out this arrow. You're right. We have to make room for the nucleophilic attack on the number two carbon, otherwise we wouldn't exceed an octet. And that'll help us to draw the intermediate for the next step. Let's go through that. I know it's supposed to be a ring, but I, I just, I'm never. It's good to see that it's a ring. You're using some good labeling techniques. It's good that you've uh, put in a lot of good labels. You put in some numbers. That's going to be helpful. You labeled the alpha carbon, and you asterisk to this carbonyl. You didn't asterisk this carbonyl. That's good, because this is not acting like the electrophile. Yeah. And we've seen in the past that one of the important skills in the class is drawing a new ring formation, but that is a challenging skill for a lot of students. Let's go through that and, and see if we can okay. nail down uh, how to do that. So, first of all, how do we know that there's going to be a ring? Well, we can kind of use, say, the finger technique here. You can see in this picture that the alpha carbon is going to be forming a bond to the number two. But the number two will be bonded to the three. That's not going to break because there's no arrow here. The three is bonded to the four, the four is bonded to the five, and the five is bonded to the alpha. Well, that takes us back to where we started, so that we are going to be forming a ring. So the first thing to do is to figure out how many atoms will be in the ring. So let's try counting with your finger how many atoms will be in the ring. Try pointing out with your finger on a piece of paper all the atoms that will be in the ring. How many atoms do you get? Take your time. We only want to count the atoms that are directly part of the ring, not the ones that are attached. So, and let's do that just by looking at this picture here. So let's point to all the atoms here that will be part of the ring and let's see how many we get. Okay, yeah, you should go back to this picture yeah. here. Um, well, it's going to be one, two, three, four. Four? Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start by pointing to this atom. This will be part of the ring, mm -hmm. so that's one. Now, the next atom that's going to be part of the ring is this number two atom. Okay. So that's two. I know that they're going to be connected to each other because of this arrow. Okay. So that's one, two, three, mm. four, five. Okay. And now I'm done, All right. because that takes me back to the alpha carbon, which is where I started. So this is what I meant by actually physically pointing out with your finger who, who's going to be in the ring. So to go through that again, alpha, that's the, that's the first one, mm -hmm. second one, third one, fourth one, and fifth one. So that's five overall. 
Now, this atom won't actually be part of the ring. It'll be attached to the ring, but it's not actually part of that cycle there. So we're going to have five atoms in the ring. So that's a useful technique to just point out with your finger how many atoms will be in the ring. And we should be able to do that if we're careful with the arrows. So that would give us a pentagon. So I'm going to draw a pentagon. Are all the atoms in the pentagon going to be carbons, or will there be any, ex any oxygens in, in the pentagon? They'll all be carbons. Good. Some people might think that they would be oxygens, but the oxygens are only going to be attached to the ring. They're not going to be part of the ring. So I don't need to erase any of these, so I replace them with oxygens. And now I can choose whichever of these I like to be the alpha carbon. Uh, so I don't know, it's whatever one uh, we feel like here. So I guess we can say this one is the alpha carbon, which would also mean it's the one we labeled number six. Okay. Okay, and then the alpha carbon, we know we should be forming a bond to the number two carbon. I could say either this or this is the number two. And I'll say this is the number two down here. Now we have to go through each atom and list all the atoms that are directly connected to them. So uh, why don't you tell me, let's go back up to here. Let's, uh, let's say what are all the atoms that are connected to the alpha carbon? Um, well, Besides, we already said the number two, so who else will be seven. connected? The number seven, and who else? Or, uh, uh, and number five. Now the number five is part of the ring. Mm -hmm. So I have to draw in the number seven. Here's the number seven. Okay. All right, while we're at it, let's list everything that's connected to the number seven. Uh, double uh, pi bonded oxygen and uh, methyl or ring. And the number eight. So the numbers help us to be very specific about who right. is attached to whom. Now let's list everybody who's connected to the number two. numbers to sure. help us there. Just a single uh, bond to an oxygen. With a negative charge indicated by this here. Good. And Anything else connected to the number two? That will be one. the number one. Anyone else connected to the number two? The number three. That's right. So we should say to ourselves, who's connected to the number two? And we can say it's the negative oxygen, the number one carbon, and the number three. Nobody's connected to the number one, so this is done. Nobody's connected to this oxygen, so this is done. Now we have to list everybody who's connected to the number three. Just number four. And right, and some hidden hydrogens, but since they're hidden, we don't need to bother worried about that. Who's connected to the number four? Number five. Which is already shown. And who's connected to the number five? And number six. Which is already shown, so we're done. So we used a bunch of important techniques here. This would be a good problem to go back through and uh, try again, because it is challenging for most students to draw rings, but it shouldn't be impossible. There are skills that we can use to do this. So the first thing is that when you see you're forming a ring, use your finger to actually count how many atoms will be part of the ring, and then you can draw that structure. And then you actually use your numbers and your labels to make sure everyone's connected. And we also used what we could call the one atom at a time technique. I just looked at one atom at a time and said, what specific atoms are connected to this? Um, Another technique that we could give a name here is we use the take, take your time technique. Mm -hmm. What most people do is they try to rush it and kind of draw what feels good, but that doesn't work. Just take your time and atom by atom figure out who's connected to who. Uh, it doesn't work if we try to, to rush it and just draw what feels good. Let's keep putting in our labels. The asterisk here shows that this was the carbon that acted electrophilically. Of course, your picture doesn't have to look like this because you could have said put the alpha carbon in a different part of the pentagon or you could have put the number two over here. So you always, it's always a little bit uh, difficult to check the answer key to make sure you have the same answer they have but because uh, there's more than one way it could look. But this is one good way to draw it. So what we've done so far is basically, well, what we've done so far is just this first step. We've just done the nucleophile attacking. It was just a little tricky here because we were forming a ring. Generally, intramolecular reactions usually do form rings. Intramolecular reactions usually do form rings and we've seen how that worked. Now let's talk about this a little bit more. This is a five-membered ring. Do you remember our five-membered rings pretty stable or unstable, happy or unhappy? Mm. Say compared to a four-member ring. Uh, it's true. Compared to a four-member ring, it's, it's more stable, isn't it? That's right. In fact, generally speaking, five- and six-membered rings are the happiest rings. Five- and six-membered rings are the happiest rings. So something that your instructor wants you to know about aldol condensation is it generally only works, or it generally works best, 
for forming five and six membered rings. That would be a good thing to have in your notes. What we're going over here is intramolecular aldol condensation. Well, the intramolecular aldol condensation works best for five and six membered rings. It works less well or not at all for other types of rings. It works best for five and six membered rings. That's not too surprising because we learned in the first term that five and six membered rings were the most stable rings. 